Welcome back to another episode of Trading Secrets. Today, I am joined by content creator, podcast host, and barstool sports personality, Alex Bennett. Alex co-hosts the Mean Girl podcast alongside Jordan Woodruff and has been a content creator for the network since she was hired on in 2021. Guys, I just found out that today her contract renews, so we're going to get into that. Prior to joining Barstool, Alex was known for her appearance on Bravo's TV reality show, Sweet Home Oklahoma, where she worked for the show's star, Jennifer Welsh. Shortly after, Alex was discovered by Barstool when a string of social media posts of her following and her mother went viral. A few years later, over 500,000 social media followers. Alex has taken full advantage of her major career change. Today, we're going to talk about the unique path from going from an Oklahoma country girl to a New Yorker in the Hamptons every single weekend, a badass businesswoman. Alex Bennett, welcome to Trading Secrets. Wow. I never sit in for the intros. Remind me you don't sit. What do you mean you don't? Like sit I never. I won't read an intro in front of anybody. How come? I don't know. Interesting. I'll just be like, I'll do it without you in here. Okay. That was great. Do you want to know where I got that strategy from? Because I will. I won't do a podcast unless I do the intro in front of them. Where did you get it? it? So Joe Rogan. This is giving some trading secrets out here, guys. He tries to make people feel very empowered. He makes them feel really good. Like a million bucks is the strategy. I want them to feel like a million bucks, and then he disarms them. So disarm, million bucks, and then you're ready for the podcast. I love that. And the only yeah. reason I don't do it is because I feel uncomfortable. Yeah. Which is usually a place I like a place yeah. I like to go and you should go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So now maybe I'll force myself. And if you screw you. Yeah, yeah, there you go. Was it good? Did we nail the intro? It was great. All I right. was smiling. See, and you're feeling good? Feeling I feel disarmed? Good. I feel like Goal you understand. Yeah. yeah. I'm like, okay, he There was knows. a little research done. He gets it. I Got feel it. safe. And on top of it, guys, we are drinking a new drink that has been introduced to me. A viral sensation from Tom Hanks, then take it over by Alex Bennett. It's diet cocaine. Diet cocaine. Okay, for anybody out there who lives under a rock like myself and doesn't know what's in here, can you tell people? Diet Coke and champagne. That's the two it. best things on the planet. That's it, people. That is it. 80-20. I messed yours up. I gave yeah. you 50-50. 80 always should have more alcohol. 80% champagne, 20% diet coke. Yeah, and I'll tell you guys, every sip it gets better. All right. Let's get into it. You ready to trade some secrets? Let's do it. Let's just start with this. When you talk about money and just your overall relationship with it, do you are you comfortable talking about that or does it make you uncomfortable? When you're with friends talking about like what you make, what you spend, are you do you avoid it or do you step into it? I always avoided it because growing up, I don't know, everyone just avoided it. And then I read a book in 2019 called Disruptor. And she was talking about how it's so weird that guys would be like, what do you invest in? But girls, we never talk about money. And so I started making a point with my girlfriends to text me like, hey, do you invest in anything? Or like, how do you and your husband structure your finances? Hmm. So I started talking about things more. Okay. And I now think about it like my grocery list. Well, that's not true. That's <laughs> such a lie. I wish I did. <laughs> I, I still feel awkward about it, but less awkward. Well, how do they respond? If you say to your girlfriends, oh, what are you investing in? Or how much did you make this year or something? Do people step into it? Or are they like, what the fuck are you talking about, Alex? It's one or the other. They okay. totally shy away from it. Yeah. And they're like, oh, that's inappropriate to talk about. That, yeah. that word gets in there a lot. Or they're like so empowered to talk mm -hmm. about it that they're like, we all deserve X, Y, Z. This is what I make. This is what I ask for. Yep. But it's never like the middle of those two. Got it. Okay. I think that's a good segue. Well, first of all, too, women live longer than men. Good right? for us. So women live longer than men. Like this is your world. You guys are taking over day by day. And like it's now... I think if you look at the percentages, like 70% of men manage finances in relationships. But if women are living longer than their men, like the importance of it becomes that much greater. So I think you're onto something here. I didn't know women lived longer. I'm not yeah. surprised. Yeah, you're like, but shocking. I'm happy to know it's an actual stat. Yeah, I love it. Well, you talked a little bit about negotiating, you talked a little bit about salaries. We heard the word like that's inappropriate. But today, you had mentioned before we started, is your two-year renewal with Barstool Sports contract. What does that even mean? Like, break that down for what that means. So when I started at Barstool, when I was in the application stage, I love the way Dave handled it because we were just on a FaceTime. Like, the process happened really quickly, and yeah. Gaz, who's our head of content and social, was emailing with me, and him and I had a Zoom call for 30 minutes. Okay. And then I took a nap, 
and I rolled over and there was a text from him saying, hey, can you FaceTime with Dave in 20 minutes? And I was like, whoa. Oh shit. Yeah, I was like, yeah. So I FaceTime with Dave. I think we were on the phone for like four minutes. He asked me a series of questions and then he said, where all did you apply? And I was like, okay. nowhere. I'm either working at Barstool or I'll work for myself. And he was like, boom, email me what you want to make. And I said, okay. And then he said, but don't value you at what you're valued right now. Value yourself at what you will be worth in two years. And I was like, okay. So I hung up and I was like, well, what's that number? Yeah. Like I had no idea. It was me and my mom at the time. Okay. So I knew what I was going to ask for. She was going to get like 20, 30% of. Yeah. So that was like a little bit of a unique deal. But I love that he told me to email. I always felt empowered by my salary because he said, tell me what you'll be worth in two years, what you're worth now. Send it to him. He responded back. Perfect. We can make it work. Now, I had a very beginner contract when I got my initial contract. So everything was very standard the way they do things. However, I had an option for a renewal of the third year, okay. which would start tomorrow technically, at that same exact, like, I guess it's called an option. Like, okay. they can just sure. renew me for one more year. Sure. I don't get a say in it. Correct. Under the same salary and everything. Exactly. Right. Same and terms, option everything. Option extension, yeah. I've been talking to them because they're so fair and they want to empower the creator. Like that's their biggest thing. But it's so funny. I haven't seen the contract. They asked me back in January, Hey, let's start talking about renewal. Yeah. And I was like, let's wait a second. I don't know why I said that, but then a lot of things changed. I started doing like drink reviews, different things. So now we're talking about the contract renewal again. And there's a lot of different things you can put in there or not. I, I would tell you if I knew. I don't know. I haven't seen it. I don't know the number. None of it. Okay. I got a million questions. So you and your mom, so your mom's handles content, Kim, right? Yes. Okay. And so you guys actually get hired together. Correct. Did you guys interview together? No. I was hired right after Alex Cooper left. Okay. The call her daddy. Right. 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 My pitch was after Dave put out the tweet saying, we've now created the top two highest paid female podcasters. Who's next? 60 million, right? That's what she got million. signed for with Spotify. Yes. So you see that and you're like, okay, I could be the next $60 million girl. Well, I'm like, my name's Alex. I got long <laughs> blonde hair. So that I could probably check, do a spin off of that. But I was like, call her daddy's not. But I was like, oh my God, I make TikToks with my mom. So I made a spin off of like, call your mommy. Okay. And that, so when I got hired, Dave was like, will your mom come? And I was like, I'm not even going to ask her because this is my dream job. So the answer is yes. Yeah. And I just went downstairs and I was like, my mom was a stay-at-home mom. And I was like, you have a job now in New York. It's only part-time. So she started commuting back and forth. So when I was hired, yes, it was both of us. But she was part-time and I was full-time. Okay. So then when you put that number out, you're putting it out knowing that your mom is going to get a small percentage because she's part-time of whatever you agree to. Correct. Okay. And he says two years from now, I want you to value yourself in your head. How the fuck are you valuing two years from now when you know little to nothing and just have picked up a recent TikTok following? I had no idea. I started researching and I had like 24 hours to do it. Yeah. But fear creeps in. Of course. So you're like, I know what I want to be, but then if they're paying me that, I have to be that. Yeah. And so there was a lot of pressure. I didn't know. What, so I Googled what I what it looked like Alex Cooper's starting salary was. Which was what? It, I think it said 70 online, I think. And then I called my brother and he was like, all right, so inflation, like sure. add a little bit. And he came up with a number that I was like, I mean, that that's great. And I, I still today love the number. Okay. So you threw the number out there. So let's say it's around six figures. Okay, we'll say, yeah, okay. give or take. Can you make bonus off that based on your performance or is there nothing like that? Because your shows have blown up. Like, can you get bonus now? No, you make, now, merch, yes. I guess I can only speak for me. I don't know mm -hmm. if there are situations where they do that. Yeah. But with mine, no. Okay, interesting. That's something, have you negotiated anything like that for the next contract? Well, I thought of some things that I would like to negotiate. Yeah. But- contracts are so, I've only done one and it was the starting one and I was so happy to have it. Yeah. Like I was like, I would sign anything that you gave me. Totally. And so on this one, I just, I need to see it. Yeah. I don't even know what my options are. Gotcha. Brianna Chicken Fry was actually right in your seat. We interviewed her and I asked her the question. I said, if you were offered a million dollars to leave Barstool, would you leave? Her response blew me away. She said, no, right? She said, I was offered a million dollars to leave. Oh, and then she said, I declined the offer. And she said, because it was only a two year deal. And when she was trying to do all this valuation, she's like, the value Barstool brings to me and my brand and everything else is more than that, I think, if I look at the long term. Do you have like a stance or what's your response based on her thought process of that? 
I think her thought process is so accurate because I laugh. I'll be on the streets yeah. and people will say, they'll just yell barstool at you. <laughs> and you're like, okay, so I'm just like a walking, like, you know, they're the yeah. only media company with a personality themselves. Yeah, totally. And it's pretty incredible on day one where they tell you, you have to be yourself. Mm -hmm. Gaz was talking to my mom and I, and he said, if you're not yourself, you'll fail. And it's like to be assigned, you would think that would be really easy. It's really hard. You know how it is on the oh, internet gosh. to be yourself because you get so much hate X, Y, Z. And you're like, at every turn, I just have to be me. Yeah. And so Barstool is so great at that because they empower anybody to be themselves and they yeah. just let you do your thing. And so I think what she said is incredibly true. And long term, if you really think outside of two years, yeah, what they can provide you and the brand is massive. Yeah. Okay. I want to get, I think that's such a good point for anyone that's in any career. Before I get to that, for this contract renewal, did you already put the number out there? No, I'm no, I told them to send me the number. Okay. And what in a perfect world, percentage of increase from where you are today, what would be the perfect percentage? 20. 20%. That's reasonable. I think so. Inflation's five, ten percent. All your shows are kicking ass. Give would, Alex what she wants. I would love it to, but I haven't said that. Okay. I've shocked myself with this negotiation. Yeah. I'm kind of just waiting. Yeah. Well, here's what we're going to do. We are not releasing this episode until you get the deal. Okay. Once you get the deal, you got to tell us if you got more than 20%. And then the recap, guys, stay tuned. We will get Alex's update if it's more than 20%. You good with that? I'll give it to you if it's not. Oh, I like that. Yeah. Either way, stay tuned to the recap. We're going to get the percentage. All right. So you came in here. You got some friends here. And you actually have an intern here. Yes. And, right? And so I asked your intern, who is awesome over there. She's loving every second of it. I said, like, what's it like working for Barstool? And she said, I don't. I'm Alex's intern. So tell me a little bit about like the structure of everything you have going on business wise as it relates like inside of Barstool and outside of Barstool. Okay. That's a great question. So Barstool is my, I call it my hosting platform, okay. I guess. If there's things though that I want to do that I can't do through them at the start, I will just go do. For example, before this, I was at Alice and Olivia making jello shots with the girl that's the founder of it and the head designer yeah. because I make these drink concoctions. So while there are some, like I have Pink Whitney and I will make you know, High Noon, I'll always throw those in there. But Alex still loves to go make these drinks and like Alice and Olivia knows they can't pay me. Yeah. I can't take payment from them, but I, so I, I kind of have these. Because of the Barstool contract. Correct. But if you weren't with Barstool, you could take payment. Yes. Okay, got But it. I love that about Barstool. I love that I can't take payment because they've got their wheelhouse. They give us so much X, Y, Z, but I'll go out there and I'll be like, yeah, I'll make these drinks with you. So I, I have these spokes in my wheel as I call it. Got it. It's a little bit more traditional influencer esque. Yeah. But more so comes from a place of passion. Okay. And I just do it because I love doing it. And also like network building on top of it. Like look who you're doing this with, right? Like that's a huge name that you're just doing that concoction testing with. And a lot of people are like, they must be paying you. And I'm like, you don't know how many times in my life I've worked for free. Yeah. Just because I know, like I. That's a good piece of advice. So the intern, intern Ames, a lot of people are like, th this day they'll say, who would work for free? And it's like, she works for free. She found me and she said, I want to be your intern. And she did it for free this summer. And then she said, eventually I'm going to have to be paid. And I said, I love that. Of course you are eventually yeah. going to have to be paid. Prove your worth why you're working for free. Work your ass off. Work harder than me and make my life easier and provide value. If you do all of those things, then you'll know that you make me money yeah. and that it would be worth it for me to pay you. So then she brought me a number that she was like, this is what I would need to make from you. I said, I have to wait on the contract. I don't know what I can pay anybody. <laughs> but I, and it, it, she, she thinks the same way I think of, you have to do things for free, I think, a lot of times because that's, that gets you so far. And I think if you always assume you have to be paid, I don't know, I've never loved that mentality. Yeah, I think that's a good perspective because if you're, I think also if you're always chasing money, when are you going to find what your passion is or what you're really good at? Because you're always chasing the bag. If you're always chasing the bag, you're going to lose sight of everything else. I think that's a huge like career navigation lesson. At least I've learned in, in my crazy career, you know? No, I would agree with that. Yeah. 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 You do. And, and you just miss things. You miss things. If you're yeah. driven by money. Yeah. Yeah. But, and I think that goes back to your point of Barstool saying, you have to find yourself, right? You can't be a creator unless you find yourself. I think so many people that listen to this podcast are really trying hard to find themselves because even if they go on social media, 
they're worried about what their boss is going to think or mom's going to think or dad's going to think. When they're in an office, they act differently than they do on the weekends. All the moving parts. Like you're an Oklahoma girl. You're now in New York doing these big things, talking about some like, you know, pretty outlying stuff for probably what you talked about growing up, right? Yes. So when it comes to finding yourself, what advice would you give for people back home that are like so stuck of trying to tailor their message in themselves based on their surroundings? It, man, that's such a good question because I always joke like now, you know, distance wise, I'm so far from home, but I'm this mean girl podcast. What I had to deal with at the beginning, Mm -hmm. what I'm just so far from home, I guess. And, and, but it's, I love mean girl pod. It's so near and dear to my heart because it's a example of me finding myself and people that I grew up with, family members calling me saying like, we don't approve of this. And then me just saying, okay, but you don't know how liberating it is for me to finally just say, okay, well, I love it. Was there like one story or one thing that sparked that first comment to you? Like, do you have a memory of you talked about this and you got a call from mom, dad, aunt, grandma, grandpa saying, what the hell are you doing? Pro- yeah, yeah, yeah. Because Maine would post our clips all the time. Okay. And they would go massively viral and we're talking about vibrators or like boob gasms, anything. Sure. <laughs> and my parents and my brother are like, she doesn't even like cuss in front of us. Yeah. You know, and, and I was the like boob gasms. <laughs> yeah. And I was like, you know, it's not like I always talked about these things with my friends. Yeah. And I just was a completely different person with you guys. It's like as a whole, I'm evolving. So like the whole entire Alex is different. And so what I would say to somebody is you start to feel it like in your gut and you're like, yeah. no, I really want to find myself. And I think it becomes a crossroad where you have to say, okay, I can please everybody else because there's more of them mm-hmm. and there's just one of me. Mm-hmm. Or I can fill that like hole in my heart and really pick me. And I think when you pick it once, it becomes almost addicting in a good way. Yeah. And you're like, I want to keep doing what I want to do truly to my core and then I think the feeling that you have inside of you gives you enough momentum to keep going. Okay. And you just say the pain of the pain of disappointing all of them is finally not as bad as disappointing myself. So I'm just going to choose me and I'm yeah. going to be me. It's like putting you, you and your needs and filling your tank as opposed to trying to fill everyone else's tank, right? Just doing yes. it the way you want to do it, how you want to do it. Yeah. Now, one of the difficult things, especially when you're filling the shoes of Alex Cooper is... I don't want to speak for her, but I don't know if like boundaries in her vocabulary. She's just like, fuck it. Do you have to create some sort of boundaries of what you will and won't share? Do you have like an internal compass with that? Or are you just like, if it speaks to me, I'm going to put it out there. I have, I had to learn that okay. because every week when you get the clips and you watch them or when somebody has something controversial to say about yourself, about about the podcast, you have to say, okay, I learned I had to finally say, if I can look in the mirror mm-hmm. and what I said was honest and it was true, but maybe not everybody loved it, but it was honest, then I was okay with it. But if I was lying or embellishing or something like that, that was my line. But other than that, I became, I was like, I'm okay with saying anything that's honest and true. And what I found was a lot of people related to it and yeah. they would DM me that. They would be like, oh my God, same. So that was the thing. And here, It's like you're creating more relatability. That's the thing. Like the, the line v- also was truly mean. If I'm talking about sex and stuff like that, yeah. fine. If I'm saying so and so is an asshole, not fine. Got it. it okay. So the, the name's ironic, Mean Girl Pod. Yeah. But what we've wanted to become is actually like an empowering place where we're yeah. honest. But if we're putting someone down, then that would be a line. You yeah. try and check it. Okay. Yes. Cool. One thing I heard you say in a podcast before, just about advice you were giving people, was you had identified through therapy, I think, your personality type and that you will follow along with a crowd if they're moving in a certain direction. So I think you, one of the things you said was, my mom always advised me, like, be careful, because based on who you surround yourself with, you have the personality type, you're gonna go their direction. And you had a great quote, and it was, if I can't find them, so if I can't find that group, I will find and listen to them, implying like, you'll listen to a podcast or pick up a book. Give me one or two people throughout your entire career that have been like your inspiration that you've looked up to, that you've listened to, that you've sought is like a guiding individual when you were trying to find that group or that someone. The number one is Ed Milet. Oh, really? Yeah. He's I been lo- on the show. He has. The power of one. Yeah, Ed's been on the show. Come on, seriously? 
Yeah. Wow. Have you met Ed? No. Oh, we're going to, let's make We follow that each other. That was like the best day of my life. Really? He's a very intense, inspirational, get your, get going, let's, in your face kind of guy. So intense. Yeah. So intense. I, Ed Milan, wow. Yeah. Okay, what's the most inspirational thing that he said that landed with you? What What are you willing to give up to succeed? So that was way, that was three years ago before I started on TikTok. Yeah. Was what are you willing to give up? And for me, that was people's opinion of me. Like I had to really keep asking myself, no, I'd be like, what are you willing to give up? I like, I'll go out like one less yeah, night. And yeah, it's like, yeah, no, yeah. what are you willing to give up? So I'd ask myself, are you willing to give up what people think of you huh. to go do what you want? And it took me like probably six months do for the answer to be yes. Have you like fully accomplished that? I am not fully there. Oh, yeah. I'm pretty close though. Yeah, I see. I struggle with the same thing. Really? Well, because like when as therapy, you do inner child work and you start to realize that my defense, my security was making everyone happy was, okay, go score the goal, be number one, get the trophy, be respectful, get good grades. So my whole like security blanket was pleasing the people that I loved and respect. Right. Okay. But the problem with that is like, as you continue to get older and older, if you continue that, you're never going to do anything for yourself. And you're always going to be so worried about what people think, especially the people that love and respect you, you're going to get stuck down a road that someone else has created for you looking like in the distance of the road you always wanted, thinking, how the fuck can I get there? But this road is taking me further and further away from that. And so what I've recognized is if you don't give that up, you're going to live a life. You're just going to be like a puppet on a string guiding. And you're going to look back at your life saying, I made everyone else, else happy, but I have nothing here. But it's a really big struggle is like, how do you, how, like, well, how am I going to have an interview and then not worry about what they say? How am I going to put this out there and then not worry about mom calling me or something like that? So I still battle with it. But okay. But what was like the turning point for you? Was it like the bachelorette or like what turning was it? Turning point was going on reality TV. Okay. Saying so, I'll do it. Because when I went on reality TV, everyone in my world is like, what the fuck are you doing? Like, so was that, a, you had to look in the mirror right then and say, I'm going to do I'm it. I'm doing it. I'm the only one. The, everyone's telling me not to do it. My boss, my family, my mentors, everyone's saying don't do it. But like for me, I was like, I'm going to do it. So that was my turning point. Because you wanted, you wanted because to Because I it. wanted to. I was like, this is going to be cool. This is going to be fun. I haven't done something for me in 10 years. I've moved a hundred times for my job. I got my MBA, checked every box, promoted seven times in 10 years. I'm going to just do something that is unconventional for me. And so that was like when I broke the blueprint. Okay. You know? Did you feel so, it too? And then you were yeah. like, I can, I'm going to keep going. I felt it. I'm going to keep going. I'm going to keep crushing it. But still back to like, it, back to the question that I, I even asked you, it still will come into my brain a little bit like, is this the right thing or should I be doing it for other people? But you think that you fully removed it? No, I was going to say because there are some days where yeah. I'll, it hits me and I'll, I'm so happy that I've come as far as I have with yeah. it and I really want to keep going. Yeah. But I, no, I'm not fully over it. But there are some days where I'm like, oh, X, you know, the thoughts start entering. Sure. And, but you, but I can shake them a you lot You just faster. shake them off now. Just, yeah. Shake it, it off. Forget yeah. about what they say. Exactly. I like that. It's liberating. I love it. All right. Let's go to Mean Girls podcast. Okay. So you start the podcast. How, it's crushing it. What does Barstool give you as far as like reporting or analytics to know how well the show's doing? Everything. Okay, they, like give me the numbers that like they pay attention to that you're trying to improve week after week. Well, we are social heavy. So we have a 60 minute podcast. Yep. We will cut that into, our producer will cut that into 18 clips, give or take. 60 second clips. We'll put those online. Those will do 10, 20 times the number of downloads. Of views. Yeah, yeah of, of, the, of the downloads, correct. Yeah, of course. listeners. Yeah. And so we're we're always trying to beat our so beat or improve our social numbers. Okay. Listenership as well. I mean, that's a steady growth, but I think one thing Jordan and I love and we're good at is the social media, taking Mean Girl and giving it a personality online. Okay. And then those clips. Okay. So what was do you think like the lowest downloaded episode you ever saw? And what was the highest downloaded episode you ever saw? She's gonna kill me i'm not the, really a numbers person <laughs> in that regard we started with office drama okay so our first month had a spike then we dipped for about three months and had to really go find ourselves i mean we were on the floor and we had to say okay we what do we want mean girl pod to be and can we can we make it a relationship lifestyle podcast and can we carry that 
So we dipped for the, we dipped. And then last summer we skyrocketed, so to speak. I couldn't, I couldn't even tell you the most, I couldn't get close. What do you think caught, like if you look at the business side of it, why do you think you dipped in those three months? Well, we didn't have any true North. Got it. We okay. had to have yeah. that dip to find who we wanted to be. We didn't sure. know each other hardly. Yeah. We wanted to get outside of office drama and started talking about ourselves. Okay. Had no idea how to do it. So it's the best thing that ever happened to us. Yep. Okay. Got it. Do you have any idea as far as like your podcast compared to other Barstool podcasts, how it performs? So they used to send out rankings where yeah. they'd be like, you're number seven. Yeah. But then we don't get those anymore. So we used to hmm. know in relation how they were, but they've been doing some restructuring, canceling some podcasts, putting yeah. more into others. So I think that's why those metrics have stopped because okay. half the office moving to Chicago, like there's some restructuring happening right now, which is yeah. really exciting. Yeah. But okay. we've stopped getting that data. That how, yeah, like how do you know if it's on the right track? Well, I also had to stop looking at numbers too. This is a good learning lesson. Because there, there's a healthy relationship with numbers, I think. Yeah. And then if something worked on one episode, you might try and chase that carrot, but you never know exactly what it was that worked. Yeah. So if I talk about some fight I had with my best friend and that's, that episode does really well, it's like, well, then maybe we're looking for like another fight or something. And it's sure. like, we just wanted to be ourselves. Yeah. So a part of me has had to back off those numbers huh. and just say, if you're, I got to give it my all. And I, I look at some, but not a lot. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's a good, I think again, like if you're chasing the bag, chasing the money, chasing the number, trying to back into like what went viral or why the episode popped, you're always going to be chasing that. And then I'll go back to the Rule number one, losing yourself, right? You're losing yourself because you're trying to chase what you think people are trying to enjoy. And yes. it screws up the whole business. We're like, if we're giving yeah. effort and yeah. we're trying our asses off, yeah. then that's good. And usually the numbers will work from there. And we're not afraid to try new things. Like mm -hmm. there's been times where we will hear like, okay, your numbers dipped. And we're like, we're not afraid of that. What was it? It's like we were recording in the office more than out of the office. Numbers do better out of the office. Things like yeah, that. Yeah. We'll look at that data, okay. but not so much what we talked about. Gotcha. And one of the things we talked about before the show was the controversy with Kelly Keegs. Ironically enough, you said you guys are, are very cordial. She's a friend. Life is good. But it's that internal controversy that actually increases the business like productivity, right? The numbers. They all go up when you guys are having those type of fights. It's crazy. It's like, why does everyone want to watch the house that's burning? Like, it's just the name of the game in this world. That's, yeah. Well, that one was funny. That probably did numbers, barstool numbers. And our episode where we addressed it did do really well. Yeah, no, it, do, it does work like that. Like, overall, yeah. the drama like that is incredible yeah. because it's, People just love, it's like a reality TV show, but 24 seven. Sure. It's yeah. on Twitter. I mean, it's yeah. incredible. Everyone's ripping. It's crazy. They're it's going nuts. off. It can happen in real time. Yeah. It's, okay. it's honestly incredible. Let me ask you about this. We've had chicks in the office and they had a really unique take on negotiating. They go in together with Dave and they say, this is our Erica, whoever it is that they report to. And they said like, this is what we want. And it's, they know exactly what each other makes. And they're, they felt like they're both incentivized. They don't have bad blood because of it. Do you and Jordan do that? Do you have an idea of what other people in the office make? I have no idea what anybody else in the office makes. Okay. Jordan and I make the exact same thing, and we know that. Oh, so that's good. It's that's great. The, that's the same, yeah. We, yeah, so we have very open conversations about that. What's different about her and I yeah. is I'm, I'm up for negotiation right now. She's not for two more months because we weren't hired Different to do times. Mean Girl together. Got it. So I was hired, and she doesn't have the option on hers. Like, I got hired, me and my mom, she got yeah. hired two months later off of a TikTok. She won a, a contest. Okay. So we our contracts weren't the same, our renewal period's not the same, and we yeah. weren't hired to do what we're doing now. That's why we're like, there's nobody that has like a blueprint ahead of us. Yeah. I'm yeah, like, yeah, we yeah. don't even know what to do. Yeah, how do you do it? Uh, yeah. But you, but you suspect that you'll be paid the same then on your renegotiation. Yeah. yeah. I, okay, and, so and you guys will move in locks then. We talk about it all the time, yeah, but I just hit a point where I'm like, I don't know, I'll just let you know when I get the contract. Okay, got it. Now you're crushing it on all forms of social media. With the exclusivity, do they own your social? Like, do they own your name, image, likeness? Not our personals, right? Okay. Right? 
<laughs> you got to look into that. I know. I'm like, I don't that's think a so. Big, that's a big name right there moving in the right direction. I think that I own my personals. And they okay. own the brands. Yes. Okay. So they own Mean Girl and then I have Alex. Yeah. Okay. So everything Alex. I'm going to check. Own. You think? You think. <laughs> Here we go. I'm like, you I, I would have signed it if they were like, we own everything and you owe us money when you leave. Okay. Like I would have signed that contract. Yeah. Okay. Well, that's good to know. Of all the platforms, if people are out there trying to build their business or build their brand, do you have one that you think is like blowing up the fastest or one that people should pay the most attention to? Well, I'm an, I love Instagram. Okay. I now I think over like everything, TikTok, over, everything. Wow. Over all of it. Yes. Because I think that, why do I think that? I think you can grow fast on TikTok, but I think something about Instagram houses everything mm -hmm. in one spot. And I think the people on there, I don't, I, I, I think you grow slower on Instagram than TikTok traditionally, especially right I out of the gates. I agree with that, totally. But I think that it, the slow growth is better long-term on there. Mm -hmm. But I'm a little older than like, okay, so Gen Z is probably all TikTok and their brains work that way. Mm -hmm. So I like, I like to consume things on Instagram. I understand Instagram and I get to know somebody on Instagram. They'll establish my loyalty. I would buy something X, Y, Z, Instagram. So okay. that's why I say it because of an overall aspect. Sure. But if you're just starting out, depending on what you're doing, I do think TikTok is a really great spot. Yeah. I think you'll grow faster on TikTok, but I think like curating a community is going to be more effective on Instagram, or Instagram, right? Like, yeah, you'll get more clicks and everything like that. Yeah. Right? I'll never forget our producer said when Mean Girl TikTok in the first like six months was at like 200 something. Okay. But when we hit 100K on Instagram, she said, that's the golden nugget. That's the stamp you want right there. Okay. YouTube subs is incredible too. I mean, they yeah. literally send oh, you YouTube a, a subs plaque. Are huge, yeah. But Instagram, that's the gold standard. What are some other like business like strategies that you hear behind the scenes at Barstool that like producers and, and people are talking about as far as it relates to like growing their business or doing things differently or, or staying up on trends? Like what are some of those conversations happening and like the think tank? Well, the best thing I've ever heard, it's not exactly a strategy, but silence is feedback. So if, if people are saying nothing, our producer used to tell us that. If you really go check the comments, if there are none, you want people to feel hate or love, but not nothing. Interesting. And I that stuck with me a lot. So if they hate you, if they are chirping the shit out of you, producers like, great. That's a view. Hmm. That's a comment. That's great for the algorithm. So that's – some of my friends will be like, oh, my God, I hate. And I'm like, "Yeah, perfect. So the comments don't bother you? Not one bit. It's wow. really hard for a comment to bother me. so rare in this space. A text from a friend back at yeah, home could hurts get me. you. But the random comments. No. The more the merrier. The more the – truly. Wow. I would rather – I'll just look at the number of comments, not what they say. That is such a good perspective. So that, you know, because people yeah. are feeling something towards you, so that's yeah. good. But would you say that – would you agree that most of your peers probably don't feel that way or no? I would say most probably don't. Yeah. Yeah, probably not. Because it's, it's, it's easier said than done, I think, like with the whole comments thing. But it makes sense. Ten it, good ones, one bad. You read the bad. Yep. Always true. But in your world, it's 11 comments. Correct. That's a good thing right there. Yeah. Numbers. I love it. All right, I'm going to take a little Ed Milet question your way. Because I was going to ask you like the one five-year plan, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do it the Ed Milet way. Okay. So he just had this whole rant the other day saying how short life is. And how you have to actually think backwards. You have to think every day when you wake up on my deathbed, what do I want my legacy to be? What do I want to know that if I've done it, I've accomplished it? And so that's why he's not afraid of death and he steps into death. Like when you think about that with the trajectory you're on from where you were, what does it look like for Alex Bennett? Like what is the dream when you sit down on your deathbed, you're like, I did it? Well, I would say... The dream is two things. But number one, when I'm on my deathbed, I want to know that I impacted people, hmm. specifically people that thought life would look one way and probably had a lot of fear, were scared to do things. So giving them, like walking with them, saying like, I don't exactly know, but I want to bring you guys with me on this journey and we're all going to be scared and we're going to do it scared. So I want to know that I did that and I reached people. 
and impacted them and somebody else. Like what Ed's done for me, mm-hmm. how he's gotten me over these fear, things like that. I wanted, I want to be on the deathbed knowing I did that for people, okay. like the generations below me. Sure. And the other thing is I, my therapist has told me it's okay to be just very obsessed with success, not in terms, mon- not necessarily monetarily, okay. but success of, I want to build some kind of a brand. I'm a, I love Phil Knight founder of Nike. I love the cra- I love how not the crash, but how it started mm-hmm. and he was like I just I love the process, not the end goal. Yeah. So I want to go through the process of building like you know, maybe it's an, a brand of some kind or a business of I I love entrepreneurship. I love like having to fail, things like that. So some kind of like a business. Okay. I really want to understand that side of things. In in like media, or are you thinking more like a product? Like I don't know. Okay. I don't know. Just something like that. But I that's mean, the next step. Use your like on a celebrity hosting platform to then build something you're bringing to people. But you don't know what that something is. And yet. it could be a community. Okay. It could be a book. I don't know like what exactly it is, but I just want to keep building things. Yes. Okay. I love it. All right. Well, we'll have to do a episode in 10 years from now to see what it is that you build. I hope something. Right? Yeah, I hope something. One thing I want to ask you about is when your TikToks go viral, you actually applied to Barstool, correct? Mm-hmm. So I think for people that are stuck in their career, they get paralyzed with what's next. How did you find the contact information? What was the application process like? There are hundreds of thousands of people that are trying to get in front of the face of Dave Portnoy. You did it in such a short period of time. What was like the trading secret to do that? I upgraded to LinkedIn Premium for a month, and I just typed best in- Best investment anyone can make. Best investment yes. ever. I don't, I deleted it immediately after because I'm just not very good at LinkedIn, but I got, I pulled everybody business side, anybody with a barstool email, okay. and I emailed them. And then I started guessing based off of what those emails were. I What'd you them. email them? A video. I made a pitch video. Okay. The number one rule of a video- capture someone's attention in the first three seconds. But on this one, I wanted the first 10 seconds okay. to capture them. I sent it to probably 20, 30 barstool emails that were on LinkedIn business people. And then I would find Instagrams and I would find if they had an email link to it. Hustle it. But just like, because I, I was like, why not? Yeah. And somebody forwarded it to Gaz. I want to say I got lucky, but I also, I can't decide if I believe in luck or not. Yeah. I do think effort is highly correlated with it. So people will be like, how do I get a job there? And I'm like, find every single person's email. And my email's on my Instagram. Right, totally. Well, and without LinkedIn premium, a lot of people can't do that. So I think like you found a tool, you invested in the tool, you then hit up 30 people. Of the 30 people, how many respond? One. Right. That's so you weren't, afraid, you weren't afraid of rejection. All right, first 10 seconds, how'd you capture their attention? I have the video. What, what did I say? Yeah. Something like... I something like I think you guys need another Alex because she was so she had just left. Yeah. I mean, it was everything everyone was talking about. I definitely said Alex, long blonde hair and cap. And then I definitely pulled my mom in in the first 10 seconds. Mm-hmm. And that's what it was. <laughs> something about that. Okay, I love it. You want something? Go get it. Email every person you know. Have a good hook statement in the first three to 10 seconds. Mm-hmm. And just let the rest fall into place where it should. Well, like, do you ever go to your DMs Mm -hmm. and there's certain ones you'll open? Yeah. And it's like, why did I open that? Yeah. It's, I always think too, if you're going to DM somebody, cold DM them. I'm always like, don't say hi exclamation point because everyone said that. Yeah, no, yeah. Say something like really catchy. Yeah, impactful. Something that's meaningful or something that adds value. Yes. Like, hey, this would be a good idea. I saw your show. I saw you do this. This would be a really good thing. Then you'll get their attention. And you have to start it because you can only see if you, when you're picking which Just one you Just real quick, like the first six words. Yeah. Yes. And I'll go through it and I'm like, I'm opening that one. Also, another lesson I learned in that little request folder, go through that often and you can sort through, I think it's, Ev, what's the thing you could sort through? Top requests. We didn't go through for a while. We went to top requests. We found a, a bank that wanted to do some work with us. This was back in 2019. We ended up doing, between myself and like some other people, over a half million dollars. No way. From one DM that I did not see. He Why found, did it filter he found to the top? Actually, what's that? Why did it filter to the top? Like, what do you mean? Because you can filter top requests. And I think it was a verified company. So oh. it went to the top. Yeah. So for those people out there, check your DMs. You never know what's in there. Could be some serious gold.
absolutely. Yeah. And and don't be afraid to DM people. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, fire away. 30 emails, here you are. Two years later, renegotiating your deal for 20% or more. That's what we're going for. And the recap, guys, we'll tell you what it is. I have a couple rapid fire questions for you as it relates to money. Okay. Ready? Yep. Okay. What is one thing that you spend too much money on that you don't regret and will never stop spending on? Clothes. Okay, what, like, specific designer? Like? I love Alice and Olivia. I buy everything from there. People think they give it to me. I buy it. I think if I – I realize this about yep. me. If I like my outfit, I'm yep. happier. Okay. I'm just I mean, a you got person. superb A-plus style everywhere. <laughs> I haven't seen you walk into a room not freaking killing it A to Z. What's the most you ever spent on one item of clothes? The most I ever spent on one item of clothes, it can it be shoes? Yep. $1,400 on shoes. $1,400. You still have them? Yeah. Okay. The, the more expensive they are, the longer they last. You ever That's resell true. them or no? Yeah. Oh, yeah. We're constantly reselling. Okay. Gotcha. Oh, yeah. What, from an annual income perspective, what is like your eyes on the prize? I'm going to really do a nice celebration when I make this dollar about. <sighs> 750 I would celebrate. Okay. How are we celebrating? Probably... I, you know, I always wanted to charter a plane yep. and say I chartered that. Like that, okay. I don't know why. I just wanted, I wanted people to get on it and be like, me, I paid. This was me. Everyone that walks on here say thank you The fuel you to me. bill, I'm paying for. Okay, there you go. 750 is the goal. We're going to have you back when you make that 750 done and done. What is the worst investment you've ever made? The worst investment I've ever made was yeah. I wanted to make these charcuterie trays okay. back when I wanted to be an entrepreneur and I, I didn't understand that. It, you needed to solve a problem in the industry. So I <laughs> made my dad this pitch. I was like, I want to make these charcuterie trays because they were, they're all the, you know, they were all the rave back, yeah, still yeah, are, yeah. but yeah. they were different colors and you could connect them and it so it could be three feet or like one foot wide. Okay. And, you know, bridal showers, anything. <laughs> and so I spent my, a lot of my savings at the time in a factory in China and got back the pieces and none of it fit and I just messed it all up and so that was the worst investment because I lost all of it. How much? 33,000 oh, I think. Oh gosh. 33k. Hurt. Okay, best investment you ever made. Best investment I ever made was I mean for real. Well, it's not an investment. Hmm. Did it something I had to put money in that I got a return on? It could be my return or it could just be, it could be something else. I, when I turned 18, my dad. The answer might be LinkedIn premium. The, the answer is going to be OnlyFans <laughs> because you would not believe if you can get over what people really think about that. I did it for boxing when I trained. Are you on it right now? Yeah, I'm still, I, so when I trained for Rough and Rowdy, which is Barstool's boxing match, yeah. I got on there and I was like, I should put a pay gate behind some of this like training content. And I did that. Ooh. I made a lot of money. And then still today, I'll go on there and check because people are just subscribed. Yeah. And it's like four ninety nine, So I just, it okay. rolls over each month. I don't post on it anymore, but I still get it. So that was a phenomenal. Do you have to pay any of that to Barstool? No. So you're only, so you do own your name and image and likeness. Dave had Jordan and I on the Dave Portnoy show at the time. Okay. And he was like, explain this to me. And we were like, we're making a lot of money on OnlyFans. And he was like, okay. And he's very candid, obviously. Yeah, 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 of course. And he was like, I, I think go get the bag. But if you keep making this much, are you guys gonna want to work as hard? Yeah. And we and so we really talked through that. It had a shelf life, so we don't even have to deal with it anymore because we're both like yeah. off of it. But it's still that's Give an me incredible best investment. month you ever had on OnlyFans. How much I made? Yeah. I think seventeen thousand. Damn. Just You're, posting boxing videos. Because people are so curious when you post, I've got an OnlyFans. They can't. They because they just want to see it all. They just want. They're just know. thinking. They're thinking. There's more to this. Thing. What is she posting? Yeah. You no. Know? There was a girl that came on here from Big Brother, and she posted just pictures of herself with different oscillating fans. That was her only fans, just different fans. And she was made her. I think what was her goal? She wanted to make a half million, right? And she, and she, and she surpassed, she said, I'm gonna come back on the show and I make a half million. She surpassed a half million, just pictures of her and an actual turning fan. People are so, people are, well, people on, they think OnlyFans, they think nude photos. Of course. But it's yeah, like, you yeah. can put anything yeah. behind a pay gate. That's a good trading secret. That, That's it's, a great it's one. It's literally just a subscription. That's think all outside the box. Think outside the box. Like, all right. you can put anything on there. That could get you to your 750 real quick and you could be on a charter jet in a year from now. I going to Vegas. Every person saying, Alex Bennett, this is your fucking jet. Thank you. I've always thought, like, why don't we just type something, you know, like a story? Yeah. Just put yeah. it on there and be like, if you guys want to read it, it's five ninety nine. There you go. I like it. Okay, last one I got for you. Charter jet can't be the answer. One material thing that you've always wanted to buy when you knew you made it. What is it? How much is it? 
Well, it's a matte black G-Wagon with black rims. I don't know what that means. You I mean, already had this. I mean, that was instant. I you didn't even think twice about it. I this. see him drive by, and it's, like, inspiring okay. to me. So matte black G-Wagon, black rims, fully blacked out. Yeah, and I want, like, the nice one, like the AMG or whatever. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. I don't know You're what those. You're going all full thing. 300 Two, 300 plus. We could pick a house in the okay. Hampton. I don't want that. I want that no, G-Wagon. you want that G-Wagon. That's all what right. it is. All right, G-Wagon and Charter Jets. That is Alex Bennett here. All right, Alex. <laughs> You got to leave us with one trading secret. So it's a lesson. It could be about money, life, career. Can't get from a professor. Can't Google. Can't YouTube it. Can only get it from your work and career experience. Oh. What can you leave us with? Well, I love Sam Presti. Scared money don't make none, but I can't say that because he said it. So if it has to come from me. Mm -hmm. Well, wait. Can I say, okay, this was what I learned during Rough and Rowdy, but do it scared. Yeah. Which is which is saying, I'll, if somebody said to you, this is going to suck. It's going to be hard. It's going to hurt, but it's going to be the best thing you ever did. Still saying, okay, sign me up. Doing oh, it scared. Okay, so do it. Do it scared. Do it scared. That is your trading secret. Rough and rowdy. I didn't see the match. We'll talk about it in the recap. David and I will have to watch it. Did you win? Yeah, all three rounds. Really? Did you know boxing is the only sport, though, that you don't know if you're winning or losing during it? No, I didn't know that. Me either. I the only the sport. Day. So you had no idea? I mean, I didn't know, but I wasn't going to be I'm saying, looking. like, after round one, you didn't feel like I'm kicking this girl's ass? No. I mean, I felt it, but yeah. they but they could be seeing something different. The judges. Would you get back in the boxing ring? Yes, I think about it sometimes. Okay, if there's one person that you would take down and you think you'd sell the most tickets, who would it be against? Somebody that I don't know. I can't hit somebody I know. I need to be somebody random. Oh, really? That I that I really start to... Do you know Alex Cooper? Well, I no. That would be a good match. I was going to say, but that I know enough about tickets. her. That yeah. I'm like, I can't... Because it's hard to hit somebody. Yes. So okay. I got lucky. All right. Yeah. And I think, imagine if that OnlyFans, you and Alex Cooper training at OnlyFans, boxing, <laughs> selling tickets. Alex Bennett. 750. Thank you for being on Training Secrets. Thank you so much for having me, Jason. For anybody that wants a little more Alex Bennett in their life, where can they find everything you have going on? At just Alex Bennett. Like, I, I should have never done the just, but the just is actually part of it. At just Alex Bennett on all platforms. Boom. Alex Bennett, thank you for being on Trading Secrets. Okay, this is an unprecedented episode. We have never done it before on Trading Secrets. Alex Bennett before and after. It's like one of those infomercials. You get to see it before the product comes out and then the after. You guys just listened all about Alex's career at Barstool, before Barstool, and her going into her new big contract negotiations. She had some pretty lofty goals with that negotiation. What we were going to do was we were going to connect with Alex and in the recap, we we're going to tell you where it stood. But there was such a wild detour that we actually had to bring Alex back. So Alex, for the first time ever in one episode, welcome back to Trading Secrets. Thank you. The drama that you just sold. How do you feel? I feel great. I'll be honest. I feel like I'm looking at like a before and after. It's like a different human. I was going to say I feel like an entirely different person. You feel lighter. You feel more focused. Oh, by lighter, I don't mean like size. I meant like your energy feels lighter. <laughs> I was thinking because I got a spray tan. I was like, I look tanner. <laughs> you feel like you're at your more focused. I feel like you're more disciplined. How are you feeling? I feel all of those things. Okay. I feel like this is who I want to be. Yeah. And the, the first person was like existing. Yeah. And... I cleared the baggage, not that it was baggage, but yeah. I, I focused and I made some moves that made me really uncomfortable and I like where I landed. Okay, we're going to get into those moves. They just listened, all the listeners just listened to everything that you had to say months ago. Do you think when you listened to it back, were you at all speaking in different tones, lights, directions, knowing that you were a Barstool employee going into your contract negotiation? Do you feel more free now to talk about anything you want, how you want, or then did you feel somewhat restricted? I think I felt a little restricted then, yes. Okay. But I also think I was confused as well. So I was tailoring it to, I knew that there was two, three possible paths ahead. Okay. And I didn't know how those were going to land. So more so confused and a bit restricted. Yeah, because I didn't want to say something on there. Yeah. And then I ended up in a totally different spot. Sure. And so I was, I kind of gave you some PR answers. Yeah. Okay. Well, we got some PR answers. We're not going to have PR answers here. So you had three paths forward going into the contract negotiation. What were those? I didn't want to say I'm, I might renew. I also might leave. I also might start my own thing. Okay. And then I renew and it comes out and Barstool's like, so what this- What thing you started? Right, this girl thought about, you know, yeah. so that's, that's what you were getting. So those were the three paths. Okay. I would renew at Barstool and I would yeah. stay there. I would go to another network okay. or I would start my own. So you went into negotiations and you knew, I believe it was 20% you wanted to get an increase. Mm -hmm. You asked for that. What happened? So at the time when you interviewed me, 
Penn still owned Barstool. Yes. Then Dave bought it back, right? Yeah. So everything changed when that happened. Or did they give it back? <laughs> well, it was a dollar. Yeah. So. So we bought it. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> For the yeah. Okay. So we'll talk about that in the recap. <laughs> how do you want to tell me how you feel about that? Yeah, you do that job. <laughs> we'll do that in the recap. Okay. <laughs> so when Penn owned it, okay. my head was in a very different space, and we were negotiating with Erica. And we were talking about l much larger pictures than just Mean Girl Pod, right? Okay. So I had spent my whole last year doing like PBR, NASCAR, things like that, sure. making myself more profitable from a barstool standpoint of how they could sell me. Okay, got it. We had that deal with her, not written on paper, but okay. we were talking numbers, and I was going to far exceed the 20% okay. increase. So that So what you wanted was definitely coming back your way. Hundred, it, yeah. Okay. That was coming. Okay, so you know what you want. Do you get the offer? Do you receive the contract from Erica? No. Why? Because she started delaying. Okay. And then she told us, she said, hey, this is going to take some time, and you'll understand why one day. But she didn't tell you about the pen deal? Nope. Okay. They didn't tell anybody. Okay. So she, because they were in the middle of working on it. Okay. So she was like, listen, it's going to look like I'm dragging this out for three to four weeks, yep. but I'm not. So just hold your horses, but we need to figure some things out on the back end. Okay. But all the while, she was having conversations with my agents, and they had gotten to a range of numbers that was like double, if not. Double? If not more, yeah. Okay. Are you against telling us what you were making before the negotiation? No, actually, I'm not. How much were you making before the negotiation? I want you to guess. Okay. You're working how many hours a week? 40? <laughs> well, and here goes the comments. She never went in the office, so two. <laughs> okay. um, but, but how many do you think? 40. Okay, so you're supposed to be working for me. <laughs> That's a PR answer. Quote. And you have to do one podcast a week? Yep. Okay. We run all of our own socials. Okay. We're the only brand that was doing that. All right. I'm going to take a shot in dark. You were making a hundred grand. Okay, 110. And I, I was going to fucking say 110. <laughs> Damn it. Oh, okay. right there and I peeled it back. It was, yeah. Shit. So, and the, the thing about that is, Actually, I, w I was brought in at 150 and I gave 40000 of that to my mom because we, we were hired together. Okay. So they gave you 150 though, without any platform, any background, just a good, good interview. Correct. A 10-minute interview. With nothing. You had no brand or anything. Nothing. To me, that's I'm impressed by that. So I think they could have got you cheaper. They, they could have got me for any number. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Yeah. I'm shocked. Now, here, here's, here's where in the interview process, I don't know – Dave said, email me a two-year deal. Okay. Like, your salary for two you years. You talked about this, yeah. But, but tell me not what you're worth now, what you will be worth. Okay, okay. So I was like, 150, and then my mom's like, I'm getting hired too. And I was like, I can't really, like, okay, yeah. fine. So did he negotiate with you, or did he just give you the 150? Emailed back and said, sounds good, we'll sign you on. Okay, so you get the 150, you do the two years, you're ready to renegotiate. What did you expect the offer to be? 300? N no, no, really, just very transparently speaking, yeah. at the time, I wasn't fully fin like fending for myself. Okay. So I would do the job at, there was a range there of like 40% that I would have done this job because I was married at the time. So I, I wasn't like a single income. Like my thought process now and when Dave called me is entirely different than at that point. So what I was expecting there was 20% more, I would have absolutely, 100%. Sure. Okay, but you're dry, you weren't like, I need 300. You're like, listen, I'm in a good spot. I'm fine. Just give me 20% and we're good. That's where your head was. I'm really, and I'm okay. really, not, I'm, I'm, money for me is important, right? Yeah. But at this goal, I can think a lot more long term than like okay. what this payment, paycheck will be. Okay. So you have an idea of what you want. You think you're going to get the offer. You don't get the offer. How do they communicate that to you? Well, I don't, I don't get the offer, and then, like, I don't have it yet. And then Penn buys it back in the news drops. Okay. And then I believe, I don't want to be quoted here. This is just me trying to remember. Oh, Erica, we're you from <laughs> oh, it's, well, it's quoted because it's recorded. Uh, so, gotcha. Uh, take, got him. Trading think, secrets. I think I would know that. Take this with a grain of salt, but I believe the way it went down was I think Erica was like, now you understand why you didn't get it. Oh, and my agents texted me. And they were like, okay, now everything makes sense. Okay. We'll pick this back up, the negotiations. Two weeks later on a Sunday, okay. Dave calls me. I'm like, what's up? He says a couple things. Dave and Erica knew in my personal life, I was barely functioning at this point. Sure. Yeah. So I'm pretty just like existing kind of. Yeah. And they both knew that. And they both were unbelievably supportive. 
Um, That's awesome. They were incredible about That's that. Amazing. So he calls me and he's like, "Listen, I understand what you're going through and what's happening, right?" Yeah. And he's like, "But I also have to say, you guys have stopped coming in as much." Now the new person that's going to run these negotiations. I want everyone to come back in the office, and I very much so want to revamp the way Barstool was, the inner office stuff. Seems extremely fair. Such a fa the Such most a fair, fair. the most fair <laughs> thing. Like, hey, just show up to work. Yeah, and like you and and you get to pick how you want to run it. Yeah. But when so when we weren't coming in, we were having very candid conversations with Gaz and Erica about why that was, and our numbers were actually growing okay. because our demographic isn't the stoolies. Gotcha. So we do really well out of the office, and Dave always said, Interesting. when he hired me, he said, I don't care if you come in or not. Get your stuff done because you might be a brand that exists really well outside. So if Jordan and I go run around the city, yeah. our, if we travel, our content was better. What about chicks in the office? They probably have a very similar ship as far as demographic, right? Yes, but we also skew just like lifestyle. Like we'll okay. get a lot more of like the relationship talk. Okay. okay, gotcha. Where they're more pop culture. Okay. Right. So there's the argument. He says you got to come back in the office. You guys say what? We say, all right. The thing about it is, and he, he more so to me is like Alex – you fought in rough and rowdy. You've been in you've been in the mud a lot up here. And I, I loved that aspect of it. And when the Kelly Keegs article happened, he was like, that, because the way Mean Girl started was Dave and I got in an argument. Yeah. And he says in it, like, you are just a hell of an arguer. Mm -hmm. And so when Kelly gives us that, which it was a fabulous, in the barstool world, that's a really fabulous setup yeah. that you can take and yeah. just, like, get in a war with her. Yeah. But at and that. everyone's watching. Everyone's watching, and yeah. that's how barstool's barstool. Yeah. But I'm, th I'm sitting there thinking, in five years, where do I want to be? I don't want a paper trail of this Twitter war I could go get in. Okay. So I was starting to realize that. Okay. I was like, this isn't feeling like... So when I have this talk with him on Sunday, he's like, you got to come back in the office. I say, hey, listen, I'm not so sure that's a fit for me now. Interesting. And, I, and Jordan also, I knew, was aligned with me on this of like, we want to do things a little bit differently. Like, we, we found what lights us on fire isn't that. So we like the podcast side of things. We like the brands. We like doing the content, but not not getting in there like getting in a fight with Kirk and stuff. How did he respond to that? Okay. You know how he is. Okay. Yeah. And I said, and I said, listen, more so me, like I I could come back in and I could do that. There's a world where I could do that and I think I could light that on fire. I really have to do a gut check here. Yeah. Because that's a lot safer for me. Okay. Then he says, your numbers are down and so I'm going to renew you. He said something along the lines of like, this conversation three to six months ago goes very different because we were crushing it. Yeah. Okay. So he says your numbers are down. So I'm the offer is I'm oh, just I, I gotta ask. Numbers down means what? Ten percent, five percent, twenty percent, fifty percent. He, didn't 50%. Know. he, he was just, just knows the numbers aren't the same. He just knows the numbers aren't the same. Okay. And I'm like, well, I don't look at the numbers. <laughs> I'm not the numbers girl. <laughs> I, I literally go, are they? Yeah. And he was like, Yeah. And I'm like, no shit, how far? And he's like, I don't know, just know they're down. And I'm yeah. like, huh, weird. Okay. Haven't noticed. Jordan's a numbers person. Okay. So I call her and I'm like, hey, our numbers are down. She's like, no, they're not. And I'm like, well, what are they? She's like, we've just had like, three of our largest episodes. Yeah. And I'm like, I don't, I don't know. So she goes in and talks to him and shows him the numbers. Okay. And he's like, no way. And then they ran like a, they ran, they did a overall bar stool top performing podcast. Sure, sure. We were eight or nine on that okay out of everyone. how many are there 50 55 maybe okay. i think that's pretty good it's good when our numbers weren't necessary we had a weird year like yeah this. yeah so that was good okay our floor is was pretty sturdy okay so eight or so eight or nine he says your numbers are down jordan goes back and says your numbers are fine then what happens though so <laughs> like where do we go from here? He, it's this very, it's very much this conversation of like, we want you guys to to start coming back in, okay. and and that's the new way we do things. And he's like, you guys could probably have your IP. Like, I want this to work out for everybody, but like, one of the biggest things here that we're staring at is like, you two need to come back in the office. And so that's where the so then, rubber met the road. That's where it starts to. So then we have, a, then we go on Barstool Radio, and it's Dave, it's KFC, and all, and they're like, you guys got to start coming back in, and we're like, but do you understand? how we feel about that after the Kelly thing yeah, and what we look at. And we were very honest with all of them. So you guys like the Kelly thing though, you, is it because you don't want another issue of drama or do you not like Kelly? No, I, I love Kelly. And I think the way she wrote that article was, a, was really good. Yeah. It was perfect for the barstool method. Yeah. I'm all, I was also 
you and I explained this to him at the time that that article was written, like leveled. You're demolished in every other area of yeah, life. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I'm like, come on, Alex. But I didn't. I, I got. I got nothing. Right. Got it. So I just kind of instead of responding to that, let that just. So you're going through the divorce. You're dealing with this shit. You're getting shit on by the public, and you're like, listen, I have a new boundary. I'm gonna do this job. I'm gonna kick ass at this job, but I don't want to be in the middle of all this shit in the office. We'll do our own thing. Yeah, and we okay. we never missed an episode. Yeah. We hit. I mean, we, no metric ever changed. Yeah, yeah. And he asked me that. How how are you guys doing the job? I said the exact same. Okay. Just not coming in there as much. Yeah. Honestly, debatably better. And we're talking to Gaz and Eric. We're fully transparent with everybody what we're doing and why we're doing it. Mm -hmm. And he was like, I get that, but you got to come in the office. So then we have a very candid conversation of like why we might not want to come in. Yeah. And they they he was like, I get that. Okay. Then. It's like PTSD. She's yeah. Going back. She's like, no. I'm like, well, I'm like, that part's probably not that. Dave and I have a very open line of communication, yeah. very direct. So there was some things I did, and he would text, he texted me and he references it on KFC radio. And he's like, I sent her a really mean text. And he's like, How the fuck are you promoting the rodeo app that was like Ooh. a Times Square post? And he's like, But you haven't posted anything for Barstool. Ooh. And I was like, but then I went, I came back and I said, that was a mean girl ad in Times Square, which is good for everybody. And they've always supported us just as we've supported them. Yeah. They're a startup. I know the founder. Sure. That was mutually beneficial. Okay. Didn't reply. I think we were good there. It's a wash. Okay. Then KFC says, hey, do you girls want to judge the OnlyFans contest? Okay. We say yes. Absolutely. We'll be there Monday, 4 o'clock. 4 o'clock rolls around. And right now, you're still operating. Your other contract has not expired. Well, I'm at will at this point. Okay. We're dragging it. Got it. So he says, all right, will you judge the OnlyFans contest? Yes, we will. Monday, 4 o'clock-ish. And he texts us Monday at 4. We're not there. We made a very, we were at the office that day, and, and we made the decision to leave. That's on us. And that was a really bad way to handle it. You made the decision to leave the company or to leave the office that day? To leave the office that day. And you didn't tell them? No. Why so did you do that? I can't even with this because if if I hear somebody say this, I want to say, shut the fuck up. Yeah. You're lying. I can't even say it. Say it. I mean, I had food poisoning and I just want to kill Shut the I, fuck I, up. I know. You're I, lying. I, I, I hate me. Like, I'm like, bullshit. The only saving grace you I have. You truly had. Then why did Jordan stay? So the only saving grace I have. Is, share food poisoning. Is that morning, I did Instagram down bad with like a thing of saltines. I had to yeah. go in the office for an interview. And luckily, I was carrying a box of saltines around. Okay. Like, I did look like a just shut. Like, yeah. so now, though, the lower brain. Could I have judged the OnlyFans contest? Yeah. Yes. Of course. I could have, 100%. And I damn sure could have responded to KFC's text when he said, it's time, let's roll. And like, you did it. I didn't respond. It seems, as someone that's not involved in this at all, it seems very intentional. It's, it was, you didn't respond. You, you guys were on your way out. And as Dave should have yeah. the next day. I get out of the shower. I see missed call. Dave texts, says, call me immediately. I call him. And he's like, did you ghost Kevin? And I said in so many words, yes, absolutely. And he's oh, like. Man, I'm getting stressed. I know. He's like, Alex. And I'm like, yep. And he's like, what, what would you do now if you're me? And I'm like, oh, I know. I know what you're doing now. And he was like, yeah, yeah you don't have the option anymore. And I was like, do I have the IP? And he's like, I'm really close to actually not giving it to you now. Why are you playing such hardball? I am. What are I, you getting out of it? I, I wasn't playing hardball. I wasn't facing it. Like, yeah. I just, I wasn't addressing it. Yeah. I was really scared to leave. Yeah. My body, my body, my brain wanted to leave. Yeah. But I was scared to death scared. to leave. Yeah. So I just kind of went mute on the whole situation. Okay. And I'm really. So you were, it wasn't like an intentional fuck you guys. It was like, I'm just like not even in a mental healthy place to address this like i don't even know how to like you're paralyzed almost by it all it was the furthest thing from a fuck you like yeah what dave did for me yeah and what i think of him yeah is far bigger than anything i could ever dream of yeah kfc was like a mentor to me while i was there like all those guys even even during the toughest times like dave would always text me when the kelly article was written he texted me and he said never stop like don't stop doing what you're doing. Like, you guys are doing yeah. it perfectly if this is happening. Yeah. He was in our corner, and he truly wanted us to succeed. Yeah. So, no, that no, I felt like shit about it. Interesting, yeah. Yeah. And I think people probably back at home have situations at work where people might perceive it as, like, you're totally giving me the fuck you. You're totally, like, putting me in a tough spot. But really, it's just they're in a really hard spot and don't even know how to react. They're just, like, stuck. 
I've been there before. I've been there with work stuff when I was in the corporate banking world. So yeah, that's hard. And I'm sure looking back on it, do you have any regrets with how you handled it or no? Like, would you have done it different? Or do you have empathy for like that you just weren't in a good place mentally? I have empathy that I wasn't in a good place mentally. Like I did, and he he knew, and he was yeah. very nice about this. But two weeks before that, yeah. I'm off the grid. I had to go somewhere. Like I was mentally like that bad. Yeah. And he knew that. And, yeah. and he was like, listen, I understand that. And I said, yeah, but I also have the wherewithal and the respect for you that I can communicate this differently. Yeah. I could do that. Yeah. But for, I'm just telling you, like, and I think I said this, I'm frozen. I'm frozen. Yeah. I'm, like, paralyzed. Yeah. So. I feel for the position you're in, but I also, from everything you've said, it feels like Dave Portnoy was so, like, realistic and real and fair. And and even, like, even, like, considerate, like, Alex, what am I supposed to do here? Right? He was all of those things. Yeah. And he was also very Dave about it. Okay. In the sense of, like, Alex, you just don't have the option anymore. Yeah. And it's like, of course I don't. Yeah. How on earth could I possibly still? Sure. sure. And and the respect I gained for him yeah. was I already had a ton and it was next level. Yeah. So you guys depart ways. Would you say it was amicable? Very. Okay. So it's amicable and he gives you the IP. Yes. He says, he does say though, if I feel like I'm being disrespected, yeah. you're not getting the IP. I feel fair. So fair. Yeah. He was fair. He doesn't do one move that's not fair. But you already have, do you have the IP now? Yes, now I have it. So you legally have it. Yes. So when he says feel like he's being disrespected, didn't he mean in like future perpetuity or was he talking about like? No, I don't have the IP at the time of the phone call. Got it. That's where he says. Okay. Don't disrespect me. You'll get the IP. Yeah. He says, he says, I can't tell. Like you kind of couldn't tell either. Like, are you sending a fuck you or not? And I know we're friends. Like I, I, it felt like that was like kind of like a fuck you but now that you've explained it especially like being someone who just went through a tough breakup your reaction the, the way you react to things people thinking logically not emotionally are going to perceive it so much different than the reality of like what you're actually experiencing right right and that's what it feels like it was yes i think earlier like i said when he says you don't have a choice anymore and then i said but do i have the ip yeah i skipped a very large part there yeah which was where i was like walking around i sat down with him yeah yeah. And I'm like, all right, I don't blame you. Yeah. And you actually just did me a favor because you made the decision for me. Yeah. Yeah. And that, and at that moment too, I felt a sense of relief yeah. of like, it's done. A little part of me knew what I wanted to do, but I was scared to do it. Got it. Okay. So, so he does, so that happens and that's just a blessing on the side. Sure. But I sit down and I say, Dave, I just want you to know from me to you, what you did for me, what I think of you, what Barstool taught me and where I'm at right now. That's awesome. And so we had that talk, and okay. he's like, I get it. Good. And he says, too, I'll always be there. That's amazing. Not in this instance anymore as your boss. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. You're the worst employee I've ever had. <laughs> <laughs> so, like, fuck you for that, Alex. And then he's like, but I, I'm here. And I was oh, like. Oh, God. See, when I heard about this, I was thinking I want to, like, be mad at Dave for it. Or, like, what's the story? Like, how do I have your back, Alex? But, like, no. Like, I get. It just seems like it was, it was time. It didn't work out. You were going through a lot. And here you got your IP. Now you got your IP. You leave Barstool. You leave the $150,000 package. And then you say, I'm going to start not only my own podcast, I'm going to start my own media group. Well, the renewal was at 110. The new renewal is at 110. Yeah. Okay. Gotcha. Well, your, your, what was your original offer? Well, it's 150, but I, I had them break it apart for my mom. So you're the so I'm, Oh, so yeah. the renewal was 110. Okay. Yeah, clarifying yeah. that. Then you go and start Just Media Group. So now you have no salary. You have your IP. And you say, I'm going to start a media group. Not just like launch a podcast. Let's make some money. Let's make up for the 110. Talk to me about that. So I call him back, Dave back, okay. 10 minutes later. Like I hang up the phone. I had been building my deck okay. in the background a little bit of what this could look like. Okay. And I was like, took a second. And I was like, all right. And I called him back. And I said, hey. If, if you keep the IP, you make nothing. If I take the IP, you make nothing. But I think I'm going to set up a media company. And if you invest in that media company, then you now have a free and clear investment in something which you know is profitable because he knows the Mean Girl numbers. Sure. And he was like, what the fuck? And I was like, well. Look at you playing a game of fucking chess. But know? I thought, I said, and I thought about it. And I'm like, if I take it, it's not good for, and if he take, and then if he invests in this, I think that's great news yeah. for everybody. Um, and he was like, you, I don't, you're insane. <laughs> and he was like. You want me to do an invested competitor? Yeah. He was like, I mean, I think you guys will actually be like 
great at ad sales. Like he was like, I think that, but no. And I was like, okay, well, at least, you know, at least you now know. And at least I asked. You swing, girl. <laughs> well, you I was sw- like, if there's one, we might call this episode Alex Bennett swings. I, I was just like, well, might as well. Worst thing you can say is no. Yeah. Okay. Just no. So then I, then I take the podcast, right? And I'm, I'm thinking about, I learn about the podcast industry, right? Spotify, Dear Media, like all of those places and how we do, how we structure rev shares and things like that. And I think Barstool is a flat organization in the best way that you have direct access to Dave. You have it to the ad sales team. We ran our own socials. So we understood what those were making. We were looking at do those you, numbers. Do you, do you know all in Mean Girls Pod what annual revenue was doing before you left around? I know it was slotted to make six fifty on last year. And by That's a lot. I know. That's a lot. I'm that's good. <laughs> You're like, nah. I was like, shit. <laughs> what were what were the like download numbers around? They would be like around hundred. Okay, that makes sense. Yeah, that checks. Okay. Oh, so you were thinking we were, you You're were hitting like it's 30, legit. 40? It's legit. <laughs> so what are the downloads on that? Oh, oh wait. Shit. So people listen to you too? I don't <laughs> right. know why either, but <laughs> okay. let me have that one, you got know? You. <laughs> um, <laughs> you got that. Give me anything. It's okay, that. so he passes 650. Talk to me. So then I'm like, oh. So I start running, running the numbers on, well, what's that cost to, to build, to run? What's a producer cost? Sure. What sure. do we got to do here? Yeah. And I'm like, well, that's not that far away. And then I'm like, oh, my God, what if we did it like multiple times? Yeah. Then we're looking at that that business model could work. Yeah. So then I thought, well, I don't want to go to a network. And here's why I didn't want to go to a network. Okay. At the time, our number, the past month, our numbers were, we're down. Down. But you were in a, I mean, you're in hell and back. So you weren't focused. I wasn't focused yeah. at all. Yeah. And I knew, actually, I yeah. knew our first four episodes would be bangers. Okay. If I... Thought Talked about, about your divorce and everything else. Not that I want to monetize off of that, but I, th- well, I thought. Well, it's your life. <laughs> monetize off your life. Well, and I had monetized. I had actually, Graham yeah. is, made the best point to me ever. You talked about all the good. <laughs> so what, you're going you're gonna to stop at the bad? Like, you're going to. He's like, don't do that to me. And I'm like, right. And he's yeah. like, you know, so I trust you with that narrative. And I was like, okay. So I knew that. I know, right? Kudos to him. Graham. Yeah, Graham's the best. So I had that. Okay. And I knew, I knew wherever we went based off our numbers we would we would make less than what we would be worth. Yes, one I mean, month. That's in. the model, right? Correct. How, how, did you get any offers? Yeah, we got three offers basically. Okay, they were, were they all rev splits. All rev splits. No minimum guarantees. One minimum guarantee, but before we even finished it, did I just say like these calls are starting to waste our time and we have our first investor, so we're off? Okay, minimum guarantee was less than you were making at Barstool. More one fifty. Okay, one fifty. So Barstool doesn't let you take outside deals on your socials. Correct. So the problem with this was they were going to own, we weren't going to be able to do that again. Okay. So that doesn't make sense because as you probably know, what I, and I learned, yeah. you can make so much off just selling your social. Oh yeah. Tons. Like it's yeah. not close. Right. Totally. So that, yeah. that wasn't something yeah. after ru- learning that, that I was yeah. going to give up. Yeah, for sure. Okay. Got it. So then you start the media company. How, what's your model? Did you raise capital? Dave says no. Did you raise capital? Yes. Okay. How much did you raise? 300 right now. And where'd you get investors? So. Or can you not say? I just call them angels. Okay. So you have some angels. Mm -hmm. Let's do this. Give one tip to someone out there right now. They want to raise capital because they have an idea. They don't know where to start. What's the one tip you'd give them? Start with, I feel so weird giving tips because I'm like, okay, I, I don't know what I would say start with. I'll just tell you what I did. Yeah. I said at first, I thought very formal about it. Okay. And I was like, I got to go to like some VC firms and I got to start doing all these pitches. Oh, I know how I thought about it. I was talking to my brother and he was like, no, girl, you don't want to mess with those people. And especially you, like you will be a nightmare for them. They'll hate you and you'll send no reports and you can't do that. They also send massive checks. They're doing like $30 million checks. Right. And he's like, go to anybody you can think of, make a list of 25 people that have a bunch of money, explain this model to them, go hit the, I'm from Oklahoma, go hit that oil market, right? And just find those people. And so that's what you did. That's what I did. Okay, so can you tell me this? You you raised 300K. How many total angels are there? Two. Okay, so there's two. So you got two checks for 150. 200 and 100. 200 and 100. Okay. You're the majority owner. I'm taking on all the risk. You're taking on all the risk. Did you invest your own capital? No. Okay. So you're what risk are you <laughs> smart girl? <laughs> OPM. We had the founder of Netflix on. He said OPM, OPM, OPM. When you start a company, other people's money. Don't use your own. Correct. You're taking on 
time risk. That's what you're taking on, right? Yeah, totally. So a lot of time and effort. All right. So now you have just media group. What is, how's it going? Like, where are you at with the business right now? So we are at the model is okay. get mean girl up and running, okay. learn everything there is that we don't know. Yep. So like that you monetize YouTube, sure. like uh, oh, just yeah. all this monetize stuff. Monetize everything. How Emails, do you sell ads? Like merch, everything. Right. How are you going to, so yeah. learn the infrastructure off this baby right here. Okay. Learned that, got the first four episodes out. You know, where do you record? Just all the things you need to figure out. Okay. Legal stuff, X, Y, Z. Get that up and running and then scale it and go bet big on three to four podcasts. Okay. And then take the model, put it to them, and then scale that. And replicate it. Yep. So you want to have how many podcasts on your network in two years from now? Give me a shot. 25. 25. Yeah. Do you have any others now, like in the works? Four in the works right now. Four in the works. All right. So that's the, the so right now it's, it's quite the detour there. It's a big detour there, but I I I learned a lot. Yep. And then I figured out that I had sat in the chair of being the creator. Yeah. And then I was sitting in the other chair. Yeah. So I understood what creators would want. Yeah. And I think I'm making them all like very fair deals. Yeah. Well, that's what we do with our agency. It's the same thing, right? So it's for talent run by talent. That's exactly what you're doing. It's a great model. Oh, we're for creators built by creators. Ooh, wow. That's awesome. Fucking sharp. I love it. Anything else on Just Media Group we should know about? No, not not really, except that it's built around the idea. I think that the industry got like really inflated yeah. and everyone does things the same way. Totally. And I think there's this call for just like fairness and trans yeah. and that you someone's gonna have to start thinking differently. Yeah. yeah. Because it doesn't make sense to go to some of these networks. Yeah. If you understand the numbers. Yeah. Shout out to the networks. They're like, do your thing, 21. But for me, I was like, <laughs> maybe not. And so I think that the way we're thinking about it and the way it's built is very empowering. Yeah. I, can I share the story of you? So Alex reached out to me just about a potential, like how much would you pay for this person if you wanted to bring them on type scenario? Mm -hmm. And I was like challenging you. I'm like, what are you doing? What are you, why are you paying this person? Why are you taking on that risk? And her exact response is like, I want to do it differently. We're creating a different model here. So I think that's cool. Year one, Dave takes a loss on us. Yeah. Right? We yeah, don't yeah, make that yeah. one ten. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Year, year two? Year two, three, four, five, he's crushing. Yeah, great. That's a great bet. But also, if he pays you 150K and you don't return a yield on that, he's now out 150K. Where if it's a red split model and it's 80%, 20%, he only makes money if you make money. So there's less risk. But I, and I need to be competitive right now. Yeah. Right? Because you're who's... getting gritty. Yeah, I got to get ready. Great. Like, I got to spend oh. money to make money. Okay. Well, Alex, I could talk to you for hours on this stuff, but I have to transition. I know. I have to transition to, you already mentioned it. You brought up Graham. Last time we talked, I think you were kind of going through it, uh, as was I. And we both really didn't talk much about it. But now you've had this public divorce, ex-husband, Graham, whose family notably owns the Oklahoma City Thunder. Not a big deal. I got to ask you, did you sign a prenup? No, I was, I was given one, but it was not signed. Okay. So you were proposed one. Yes. And you said no. Correct. How'd you pull, how'd you pull that off from a billion dollar family? <laughs> well, I got it. AB swings. <laughs> AB swings. Only person who's married into a multi-billion dollar family that didn't sign a prenup. I know. I love the, I, uh, the law's good. The law's good enough. Okay. And that should just work. Okay. So that was your angle. Probably would have fared better if I signed it. <laughs> really? Wait, so. how, how, wait a second. Tell me how that works. So then you go through the divorce. You're, how much have attorneys cost you? Did you get an attorney or a mediator? An attorney. Okay. Has that, did he pay for the attorney? You pay for the attorney? That is expensive. That's expensive. I worked for an interior designer okay. who we had a client that was an attorney. Okay. We call him the judge because okay. he just, he's done some good cases. Okay. He, rep, he did the prenup with me. So I texted him and I was like, all right, things are going to The prenup down. that you didn't sign. Yeah, correct. Got it. Because you just redlined that thing and it was like, whoa. I like how you got names for everything. The angels, the judge. Okay. The angels, the judge, the documents. And so I texted him and I was like, hey, it's looking like we're going to separate here. And he was like, this should be pretty simple. Like, so I got you. Hmm. So I had no fees. Okay. So no fees, no prenup. How much did you, I mean, I think anyone listening right now is like, okay, you married a billionaire. You didn't sign a prenup. Like, did you just win the lottery? So the law goes, I I made more. And so technically, I would owe him. How is it possible? Well, the money isn't like, it's not his money. So it's to in speak. a trust. Right. So when you're comparing Alex and Graham as two humans, 
that's how it boils down. So all of his wealth is protected in a trust, which would then technically not be his. Right. As a result of that, when you divorce, you're splitting assets and then based on income and his assets are all protected in a vehicle so that they're technically not his. And as they should be. And yeah. I, I Oh yeah, yeah. No, I think it's I'm not I think it's yeah, it's no, smart. but that it's, it's really it's very, smart. Very, yeah. And I mean, this is why they do that, right? Like, and no part of me thought I was entitled to any of that. Yeah, of course. The yeah. only problem was, here was the only problem. I had worked, you know, five years of six figure jobs. Yeah. And didn't have any of that when it ended. So what I wanted back, what I asked for yeah. back, was I took the total number of the salary, I divided it into a third, and I was like, hey, this this would be this would be nice. So we hang on, hang on. Did you did you pay him? No, we okay. it was a wash. So it was a wash. No one got paid. You didn't you made zero dollars on the on the process of being divorced. Correct. I feel like that is never how divorces end. It's not one way or the other, right? I feel like it never ends in a wash. It, I not that I know of, but can I say this? You can say anything. Best thing that ever happened to me. I needed that. I didn't know it at the time. I got like very angry actually. And the girl sitting here today, yeah. like I'm so glad that it that it happened that way. Like Alex needed that. The divorce or the way it got the, the way all of it. it was the way the way. the way the, the yeah. finances ended. All of it. Yeah. Did but, you have a joint account or no? Yeah, we had a joint account. Okay, you just split that down the middle. No, I got logged out of that. <laughs> Couldn't log into that. Did you have money in there? Yeah. Did you get uh, that back? No. So it sounds like it wasn't a wash. Not technically. Any trading secrets on a high note you could leave us? Because you said that you're so glad you went through that because this Alex is a different Alex. Biggest takeaway from that that we can take back at home if we feel stuck, if we feel confused, if we're not sure if we're making the right decision in a place where it's got to be a hard decision. You did that. What advice would you have? Well, open up a savings account. <laughs> but But really, I think it would be I was really scared. Yeah. And I think money has holds like a lot of power and it's like symbolizes safety. Yeah. And there are lots of instances where that's very true and like you can't argue it, right? Yeah. But I think if that's the point of differentiation of like stopping you, if, if there's something holding you back from what your heart really wants, don't let anything. Like everything is figure outable. Okay. So follow your heart and yeah. everything else will fall into place. Follow your heart, trust your intuition, and just do it. It sounds like, I, like another way I would theme this entire episode is like do it scared. I think what's so cool is I think you're an inspiration for so many people that are listening to this through what you went through with your relationship, where you are today, how you were in like such what a dark hole that is to be professionally and personally completely lost, but like find your way out raise capital from an interior designer to raising capital to now starting your own media company, being the best AB out there. I'm proud of you. I think it's awesome. Thank you, Jason. It is so cool. I can't wait to see what you do from here. Thank and you. this is the first time ever we had a before and after. So you guys, Money Mafia, let us know what you think about this transition. I think it's going to be really cool too to watch the YouTube back where we're going to get to see the before and after in all ways, like even your energy, everything about it. It's going to be awesome. I was going to say, I'm going to watch it because yeah. I want to see her. Hell yeah. I yeah. want to see her. I want to see her. I like this one better. Me too. I, I like me so much her. more. I like you so much, <laughs> but I still want to see her. I got to watch her. All right. You gave us a trading secret last episode. We got to get a trading secret from the after Alex Bennett. One trading secret could be anything about life navigation, finances, Dealing with breakups, business, anything. The credit scores matter. So don't let those, don't fuck that up. Let's go. Did you fuck it up? Yes. Oh, no. <laughs> I'm learning. All, and you got to, death and taxes, got to pay those. Death so. and taxes, you got to pay those. We might have to have a deeper conversation about that. I just have a book coming out called Talk Money to Me. The first chapter is all about the importance of credit score. I got to read it. You also have to know the credit score of the person you're talking to because in this world, so many people gaslight through assets. They have all these things. They have all this show. They have no dough. And when you see someone's credit report, you get all the answers. There's no gaslighting. So that's my trading secret to you. Well, my trading secret to the next person that I date is don't take Jason's advice. Yes. Because okay. don't look at my credit score. Okay. <laughs> 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 oh, God. Alex, you show me your credit report. You're out the door. Yeah. Oh, yeah. 100%. <laughs> no. It, I think the big thing, too, on with this, the biggest thing is transparency. The fact that you just own that is so huge. So many Americans don't own it. You'll work on it. You'll get that score back up. It's the people that hide from it, run from it, deceive from it. So everything you just did, as always, super healthy. 
Alex Bennett. Thank you for being on another once-in-a-lifetime episode of Trading Secrets. Thank you, Jason. It was a pleasure. The pleasure was mine.